The character of Razumihin in Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment states that pain and suffering are always inevitable for a large intelligence and a deep heart. The really great men must, I think, have great sadness on earth. Hi, I'm Hamish Black and this is Writing on Games. From Software's Dark Souls, due to a number of factors, has spawned its own legacy as a piece of media that revels in the grim and the macabre. A grand guignol of the developer's sadism and the player's masochism. This is due in large part to the way the game was marketed upon its release. Prepare to Die graced almost every piece of promotional material associated with the game, as well as becoming the nomenclature of the complete edition of Dark Souls, which included the Artorias DLC. Its unflinching sense of constantly escalating challenge also played a part in this. The game was described in almost every review as one of the most difficult games made in recent years, and many likened it to the often sadistic difficulty of many older games whilst seemingly also forgetting that those older games, even on consoles, were still very much in the mindset of the arcade, where the goal was to extract as much money from gullible infants as possible. In any case, it is clear that many regard Dark Souls' legacy as one of unrelenting challenge and intimidation, of the macabre and the miserable, of death. Are they correct in asserting this view of the game? You could certainly make an argument for that case, but to do so I believe would be reductive. In fact, I would go as far as to say that Dark Souls is actually about as uncompromising a celebration of life as the medium of games has produced up to this point. Whoa, 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 slow down there Hamish, where are you coming from with this? Well, this, albeit totally anecdotal argument, comes from a very personal place. In fact, it comes from my own experiences wallowing in what I imagine to be the endless sorrow of life and imagining my own ideas of death. That is to say, they come from my experiences with severe mental illness, specifically major depression, anxiety and to a lesser extent OCD. For context, I have dealt with these issues for many years and they have driven me to some incredibly dark places in my time, including multiple attempts on my own life. Depression robs you of your rationality, your personality and your energy. And without those, your brain develops a pretty warped view of what it means to exist, and a fairly nihilistic approach to existence, as laughable as it may seem to some, is almost inevitable in cases like this. Why am I talking about this? Well, because I believe that my experiences with suicidal depression and my experiences with Dark Souls resonate with each other in some pretty odd ways. Not only does depression warp your ideas of what it means to exist, surviving something as traumatic as suicide attempts and deciding to carry on necessitate viewing life in a totally different way. Just like during depressive episodes, what other people might view as totally innocuous, you might view as a threat to your very being. After surviving your own irrational urges to end your own life and coming out the other side of that, it's impossible to view life and death in quite the same way as you did before. And that way still might not line up with what is considered to be normal. For me, I moved into a state of what I like to call affirmative nihilism, retaining the feeling of relative insignificance whilst also feeling freed of the burden of having to live my life for anyone else as a direct result. How does this relate to my experiences with Dark Souls then? Well, in short, I would say that the revelation that occurred after my last suicide attempt regarding my views on life and death were enforced by the way Dark Souls tackles the very same ideas. Dark Souls came into my life just at the right time and I would argue minimised the very prevalent risk of relapse that comes from a traumatic experience such as suicide. You see, every element of Dark Souls design resonated with me in a way that at first fell in line with the surface legacy of the game that I mentioned at the start. However, as time went on and I moved from my point of being suicidally depressed to realising that I wanted to get better and live, I realised that the complexities of choosing whether or not to end my own life were entirely reflected by the duality of almost everything in the game. This was as revelatory an experience to me as the post-suicidal realisation of wishing to perpetuate my own existence and I would argue it played a substantial part in teaching me how to get better and also in reinforcing my newfound ideas regarding life and death. In short, Dark Souls helped convince me that it was alright to keep fighting through what I originally saw as unbeatable and has led me to a point where I'm making good progress in tackling my illnesses. How does it do this? Well, people talk all the time about the harsh but fair nature of Dark Souls' difficulty, but arguably this extends to not only the visceral nature of the combat, but the narrative and lore and the world design, right down to the mechanics of life and death within the game. What's key, at least to me however, is that ultimately Dark Souls is not a game that wants to beat its players senseless. It thrives on player triumph. It wants you to succeed. You just need to learn the rules and how to work around them. For me, the idea that a game was finally representing what I perceived to be the harshness of the world I was living in, despite its fantasy aesthetic, yet was simultaneously urging me to fight through it, was quite refreshing. 
depression and the lack of energy to do things it creates arguably leaves most with quite a bit of spare time. At my lowest point I was jobless, broke, I'd just graduated from university with a degree I knew wasn't going to get me anywhere. I had shut myself off from many of those closest to me and was becoming more and more of a recluse thanks to the depression. During this time, understandably, I devoted a lot of my time to video games. They helped me feel connected to at least some form of universe or world. They allowed me to become immersed in interesting narratives, or they allowed me to maintain some form of reflexes with a minimal expenditure of energy, which, when you are depressed, becomes the most valuable of commodities. However, I couldn't shake the feeling that these games I was playing, no matter how grandiose their narratives and writings seemed in their quest to show us the human condition, they almost always failed by placing us at the centre of the action. Even if the centre of the action is a place where you have to conserve ammo or healing items or make choices regarding who gets food and who doesn't, for example. You are at the centre of all of this. You decide these things that affect others around you. Whilst I get that sometimes this can be used to great effect, see Spec Ops The Line, I never felt that these were actually representative of the situation I found myself in. They automatically place the player in a position of empowerment, and as I talked about in my video on player agency, sometimes that is not the way to truly immerse the player in your world. Regardless of your views on life, we as individuals are largely insignificant, and that's an important thing that doesn't often get reflected in games due to the inherent need for the player to control and be at the centre of the action. However, Dark Souls manages to navigate this duality, and with a great deal of panache. It places the player in a position of relative insignificance, in a world that isn't just hostile to the player, but crucially indifferent to them. The world would exist whether or not the player was there to experience it. Things would keep on moving. Your goal within the world is either to prolong the Age of Fire, or extinguish it and bring about the Age of Darkness. The path to achieving this goal, however, twists and turns to the point that it's easy for the goal to become obfuscated to the player, for them to forget what the larger narrative even is. This isn't bad storytelling, quite the opposite. It brings the narrative down to a singular, relatable level. The main cataclysm and how you affect it no longer matters in the same way it might in a more linear, player-focused game. The player's goals as a result become, one, making the experience in this cold, indifferent world as bearable as it possibly can be, because there is joy to behold in this world if you can get past that, and two, reclaim as much agency within this world as you possibly can. I can't tell you how much this realisation of what Dark Souls, or what I think Dark Souls is trying to do, helped me deal with my own emotions and mental illness. This game is life! The world around us is completely indifferent to any of us and would continue whether we were here or not. With that in mind, the way to live a happy life becomes clear. Take the little steps to gain as much agency over your life as possible, and make the lower points as bearable as possible so that you can experience the numerous high points that come after them. The small things in Dark Souls include learning the mechanics of combat, learning when to dodge, when to parry, how to manage your stamina and inventory. These are all fairly small elements when taken on their own, and they each get learned and honed separately as the requirements in combat become clearer to the player. But when added together, they become an incredibly deep combat system that make the player feel like a master of the systems in a way that no other game allows the player to feel. Compare this to how I was viewing my life at the time. My idea of where I wanted to be compared to where I was seemed like this incredible gulf, and this arguably contributed a great deal to my feelings of hopelessness and worthlessness because I thought nothing could change. It was too big to change. By focusing on the tiniest things, like forcing myself to get showered and dressed when I wake up, or finishing that piece of music that I was writing but was going to give up on, or cooking myself a healthy meal, or lifting weights, or working on this damn show, whilst I'm still very much in the early stages of getting to where I want to be in life, breaking it all down and focusing on one element at a time allows me to progress in my life, no matter how glacial that progress might seem at times. Dark Souls taught me that it was okay for that progress to be slow. Working to achieve that progress is enough to keep going with it. What initially seemed like an utter brick wall of difficulty in Dark Souls, I was able to chip away at gradually until I became actually pretty good at it. What's more is that I trained myself to become good at it. The world of the game didn't help me do it. It couldn't care less about me. The design of the game, however, subtly encourages you to keep going with it, so you can feel the celebratory feeling when you overcome an obstacle. Taking this approach and applying it to my life allowed me to realise that even if I didn't have a concrete goal in mind, as long as I was working to make sure that I could see the joy of life, then that was good enough. 
And there is joy in life, both in Dark Souls and subsequently I discovered in the real world. One might think of the joy of Dark Souls being as simple as mastering each combat encounter, as this is arguably the core gameplay mechanic. Sure enough, the mastery of the combat system is the payoff for training yourself to become better at the smaller systems that make up the larger whole, and as a result every combat encounter and victory feels more substantial because it's all truly earned by the player, but for me there was a much more simple source of joy that I found within Dark Souls. The views. That may sound silly, but the stunning world design and the vistas in Dark Souls encouraged me to keep going even when the difficulty felt insurmountable. Even when the design is at its most grim, such as in Blight Town or Sen's Fortress, there is a level of detail and architectural consistency to the design of these places that they take on a warped beauty of their own, and as such exploring them is just as rewarding as any other area of the game to me. Why do I mention this? Because it actually encouraged me to go outside and explore the world around me in real life. For the longest time, my depression had rendered me a recluse, which led me to feeling incredibly isolated and alone, whilst also viewing everything outside my curtained bedroom window as a threat. Dark Souls reminded me that I actually am fortunate enough to live in a fairly pretty place myself in Western Scotland, and the joy I had of discovering new places and simply taking in the atmosphere and staring into the distance of Dark Souls vistas encouraged me to get out of my self-imposed prison and experience it for myself. It took a long time to get to that point, but as Dark Souls also taught me, as long as you are teaching yourself and training yourself in little steps, no matter how glacial the progress might seem, it will eventually yield rewards for you. You just need to know where to look for them. What's best is that From Software is acutely aware of all this, from the legacy the game has garnered to the ways in which they very deliberately subvert this legacy. For one, difficulty is not the main element of the game. In fact, director Hidetaka Miyazaki has stated that the main concept behind the death system is trial and error. The difficulty is high, but always achievable. Everyone can achieve without all that much technique. All you need to do is learn from your deaths how to overcome the difficulties. Overcoming challenges by learning something from a game is a very rewarding feeling, and that's what I wanted to prioritise in Dark Souls and Demon Souls. And because of the online, you can even learn something from somebody else's death. I'd say that was the main concept behind the online too. The online is another key element of how this game helped me deal with my depression. It helped me realise that I'm not alone. Depression can lead to people feeling more isolated than they ever have done in the past, and this can be one of the main reasons the illness feels so insurmountable. The idea that the world around you is out to get you, and that you are alone in this struggle is utterly demoralising. However, once you realise that far more people suffer from this illness than many people think, even if their circumstances and the way the illness affects them differ completely to how they might affect you, just knowing that they're ultimately fighting the same battle can be enough to convince someone that the battle is indeed winnable. I don't think I really need to explain how this relates to Dark Souls multiplayer, but I would argue that the game would flat out not work if not for the summoning system, which, although derided by some as a means of not playing the game right, can give people a sense of respite when they need it the most. Or even just the spectres that sit at the bonfires as you approach. They exemplify the game's philosophy that, hey, you're ultimately the one that's going to have to work hard in order to survive in this world, and the world is brutally indifferent towards your presence, but you can get through this, because you're not alone in your efforts. Maybe it's just my warped post-suicidal perspective on life talking, but I ended up taking a great deal of comfort from this outlook. This is why I say that Dark Souls is a celebration of life, rather than simply a showcase of death and sadism. It communicates these ideas without at all feeling patronising, and just representing what it truly means to live. Its design, mechanics and writing are all geared to encourage the player to keep fighting through, even when it seems insurmountable and guides the player as to how they should break down a problem and solve it bit by bit. In fact, the game actively trivialises death. At least on your first time through, you are going to die far more than you are going to succeed. To an almost comical degree, death becomes inevitable, expected, rote, but not in a way that forces the player to resign themselves to that fact. As I say, through working on those small elements, you can create your own agency and become what you want to be in this world. The world is so consumed by the idea of death that the times you survive will become true moments of triumph to be fully celebrated, and the game will celebrate with you. Before, of course, plunging you into the next horrific difficulty wall head first because, you know, Dark Souls. And because, you know, life. But it's okay, because both can be pretty cool sometimes. Hopefully I've made it clear how the close ties between Dark Souls world and the real world reflect and resonate in some pretty interesting ways, for me at least. 
Like I say, this is purely anecdotal. The science is largely still out on specifically how games affect pre-existing depression. So don't take this as me saying, playing Dark Souls will cure you of your depression. However, just know that a lot of the lessons I learned from Dark Souls ended up becoming incredibly useful to me in recognising the joy in life and teaching me how to achieve it when I previously had been so resigned to the idea of my own death. That's pretty important to me, and is something perhaps more games should explore. Reality doesn't centre around the individual, and that's okay. As has been proven to me by Dark Souls, sometimes that's exactly what is needed to remind you that things are alright, and you're not alone. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this slightly different, more personal episode of Writing on Games. If you enjoyed it, then if you'd consider subscribing, that'd be really cool, and I'll see you next time.